an angry black woman. I'm not an angry black woman. In fact, I'm a very eager black woman. As it was said before, I decided to approach equity, diversity, and inclusion, and particularly belonging, in a half glass full approach, which makes me eager to help people understand how others see themselves and how you may see them. Part of being a planner is understanding communities. The part that makes you so unique is being able to understand communities that are unlike you. After going through all the polls and listening to conversations at the last planning conference, and in particular looking at the surveys, it was obvious that inclusion is a priority, but actually implementing what needs to happen can be a challenge. Now, don't be concerned because this is true of most organizations. And I would say in planning, architecture, and real estate, we're slower at the pace of seeing the change. Part of that is because that was a systematic design, design that included everything from redlining, segregation, zoning policies, and everything named around planning. Now we are in a different times where the future generations won't tolerate exclusion. In fact, the future generations will only work with organizations and play with people who are about belonging and inclusion. Now there are those exceptions, but I'm proud to say they're outnumbered. The majority of people are not only eager to learn, but eager to act. So we're gonna get into a little bit about what you can do and talk about the success stories. Now, many of you know about the history. Many of you know how some feel guilty and others are clearly in denial. And then there's the rest of us, those of us that are ready to go to work, implement, take chances, experiment, and ask lots of questions. So today is your opportunity to ask questions. Take advantage of the chat and ask questions that you may not feel comfortable asking in public. You're in a safe environment. Being in a safe environment is the number one way that we start to see change. The reality is the planning industry as a whole has been talking about diversity inclusion long before other industries, but implementing it is a lot harder because it impacts communities. It changes the way people live, and it definitely impacts the economy. In fact, as we start to see a recession happen with housing, we'll start to see a lot of changes that were unpredictable. Some of them are going to look exactly like previous times during the civil rights of 1968, during the Great Depression, and even now as we embark in a world that's engaged in a war. All of these impact how communities are, how people are migrating in and how people are exiting out of communities and how some are even displaced. But enough about all of that. Let's get into what makes it great. I'm gonna share with you a little bit about my story. My background is in urban planning and it started off really in architecture only simply because my dad was an architect and I didn't wanna do anything like him. But because of an experience in university that made me realize that not only do I have an opportunity, I needed to fight for the opportunity to be amongst others not like myself so that they would be aware of the contributions of not only African-American, but other indigenous people of the United States and people internationally who have not only influenced, but created the blueprint of urban planning. Let's look back at the ancient times and ancient civilizations, whether it be the Romans, the Egyptians, Jewish communities, wherever you may think people live, that's where planning has always taken place. But we have an opportunity to be strategic of how we plan moving forward. Once I used to say, maybe I'll cry, maybe I'll sing. And then came the time where we wanted to know, will freedom ring? We are going to talk about not only will freedom ring, but who is in your circle? Who's in your ring? I'm gonna share my screen now. And we're gonna talk more about the specifics about planning opportunities and moving forward. Can you all see my screen? I'm gonna keep going unless you say otherwise. Oops, doesn't wanna play nicely. Hold on, let's get this right.
The diversity difference leadership is about how you can make a difference through diversity. Now, as we all know, inclusion is the number one way in which people start to be able to not only hear a voice, but being seen. So many people go through life not being celebrated but all of us can remember the time where we were celebrated, the time when you were acknowledged, the time when you were coached, the time when you were heard, and the time where you put forth to be a leader. What I know, hands down, after working with many organizations, that it starts with leadership. If you are a multicultural thinker and you start to have the mindset that diversity equity and inclusion is in every aspect of your organization, from IT to human resources to working with the populations around you, to your leadership team, and those who are onboarding, and then those who've exited the organization. What can you learn from all those organizations? You individually have to lead by example. There's so many parts to inclusion, feeling like you belong, but let's break it down into areas that I know have always worked in every organization. Martin Luther King was the perfect example of collaboration, of bringing people together of different mindsets and was able to show them the benefits of working together. Part of his skill set was being able to get people to follow his lead and put other people in charge of leading in their own way. That requires a mentorship relationship. I've had the unique benefit of having a mentor for the last 25 years who I started with as an intern at the Denver Urban Renewal Authority. And I really got to see not only the dynamics of planning and zoning, but the politics behind planning. Understanding that the economic benefits had more to do with the people involved and not just the money. Understanding how you retain talent is just as important as recruiting talent. But if your workforce and workplace has not changed and people don't feel safe, you can guarantee that they're going to leave. Part of that comes with being able to trust one another, being able to know that you can ask questions without there being any judgment or being in a place where you can make mistakes and still be celebrated for growing and not being reprimanded or knowing that you may potentially lose your footing or lose opportunities because of it. When looking at the surveys that you all completed that was conducted, Going across the line, between 40 and 50%, people felt that they were uncomfortable speaking their truth, and the truth I'm referring to is not feeling like they were treating fairly because it might impact their ability to become future leaders. So knowing that leadership team respects and values your opinion and understands your perspective and why you may think differently or why you may see a way that you can do things differently makes a big difference whether people stay. That requires empathy. Empathy is something that comes from within. Understanding how inclusion work is really about you. How are you treating others? How are you learning from others? How are you stopping yourselves from making judgments making opinions based on how you were raised, your heritage, your background, as opposed to understanding how the others around you were raised, their heritage, their background, and their experiences. Having a sense of humility is the key component in understanding that you may not have all the answers. In fact, instead of being guilty, having some humility and knowing that you cannot change the past, but you certainly can make a difference in the future. And that requires you to be humbly position to learn. Now, the data is important because if we can measure the change, we know that we are making a difference, but that data doesn't come easily. We have hundreds and thousands of years of undoing things that have happened. And from 1968 through fair housing, we started to see a change and how civil rights was impacting how cities were developed. Now let's talk about practicing what we preach. I practice what I preach because of my lived experience, but I too have made many assumptions of how change is always for the best. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes our failures as a result of change is where we grow. In fact, change is not easy, but one thing is for sure, as of 2020, we all experienced one change collectively, and that collective change forced us to stop, listen, and learn. And through all of that, we figured out that we had one thing in common. Everybody was trying to survive and people were questioning whether or not they could thrive. And everyone was forced to do life differently. 
Now, many of the metrics that we measure is important to understand how far we've come and how far we need to go. But most of what we've seen in all of the statistics that Herbert said is that developing the change with employees doesn't have as fast as you think. In fact, many people recognize that just understanding the differences, implicit bias, knowing what is right from wrong based on if you think you're right or they're wrong, or if you're the them or the us, happens systematically and over time. Understanding the training is part of the solution, but understanding the problem is where the work starts to begin. Now, many people see leaders in our industry and looking at the statistics again, that the majority of the leaders in urban planning industry historically, starting somewhere in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, were traditionally white men. Now, let me be crystal clear. This is not an opportunity to make white men feel guilty because I can tell you from experience that where I have grown is from the conversations I've had with white men who we're going to say are the majority in the industry. Now things have started to change, but when we look at pay structures, when we look at equity and we look at how people feel, who's in charge, who's making decisions, hands down the majority of people believe, whether it's true or not in all situations, that as an industry as whole, traditionally it has been white men. Now here's the fun part about this. Most of these men who are in their 50s and above have experienced civil rights, have experienced change, have experienced all the things that have happened in our industry, including fair housing. So not only have they been the recipient of change, they have the opportunity to be the leader, but that happens through allyship. Creating allies amongst each other, asking questions, figuring out where we've made those mistakes that are hurtful and understanding what is helpful. Now, there are so many things that people need to understand about the training. Training happens by understanding terms, understanding the effects, but practicing it. Practicing is where it matters. Microaggressions are a perfect example. People don't recognize the things that they say that might make a difference by just making assumptions. Let's use the example of when you're in a meeting and you're in a group full of people and somebody makes an assumption of who the leader is by their eye contact, by who they're giving the most attention to. If this person in the room would be considered in the minority only by number, not by the way they feel or not by the status that they see themselves, but if they have the least amount of power just by the assumptions of what historically that role would have been, and they are actually the leader, those who are engaging with them, who are automatically looking to those who have traditionally been the leaders is a simple form of a microaggression. Now, stereotypes exist for everyone. Let's use the example of, I would consider myself to be an articulate black woman. Some may say, I think you're such an articulate black woman. Now, many would say that is offensive if you, would assume that as a black woman, I wouldn't be articulate. Others may see it as a compliment. Stereotypes are true. Some may believe that they don't exist, but they certainly do. They're neither right nor wrong. How you respond to those stereotypes and prove that those stereotypes are not true is not only a burden, but an opportunity. The burden being that you're having to prove yourself. But let's be honest, one of the best things about moving forward and going through adversity is being persistent. That persistent allows you to become stronger. So I say, use this opportunity to be persistent and continue to move forward so that you erase the stereotypes that might exist by practicing what you preach and performing. Now, who's in your sphere of influence? Let's say that again. Who is in your sphere of influence? Who are the people around you? These are the people that are impacting how you think, or maybe even what you think about them. Now, if everyone around you acts like you, looks like you, has a similar background and heritage, one would assume your decisions will start to be similar. But when you intentionally surround yourselves with others that are nothing like you and ask those questions, regardless of their position in your organization, you will start to see innovation innovation of ideas, and you'll hear shared experiences that will not only change how you view them, but how you change your work environment. Now, recently I had the opportunity to participate 
in an event that happens every year regarding historical preservation here in Colorado, celebrating those wonderful buildings that have been not only saved, but invested in and making sure that through the efforts of the community, they're still alive. Now, let me be clear. How I came to this organization was because of my mentor. She recognized that in the room year after year after year, the same type of people were showing up. The generation was getting older and the people were staying the same. So she started inviting me to this event. And at some point it turned into an, not only an invitation, but an opportunity to share about my experiences with historical preservation. So at the Saving Places Conference, we changed it up a little and I called it Saving Places and Faces, recognizing that gentrification is a real thing, that gentrification has impacted how buildings are saved and lobbied for and against. Now let's be clear, gentrification for some may seem like an investment in the community and others seem like a displacement. But this is an example. At our table, here are three of the guests, myself, my mentor, and a city councilman that come from three very different backgrounds. This was a very intentional coming together. The rest of the table reflected exactly what was intended. It was an intention to bring us all together unapologetically who think differently, act differently, and have a different vantage point. This is something that requires continuous effort. This means in every situation that you're in, how can you include a different perspective, whether it's bringing in somebody to the table or listening to somebody's perspective. And that requires you going to them and them coming to you. It requires a compromise and opportunity to have conversations. Now, there's so many ways that you can change a dialogue. Oftentimes, people feel uncomfortable asking questions because they don't know what the response is going to be. But the discriminatory words that are used, sometimes people don't realize are discriminatory. Knowing that you are in a place where you can say, that didn't feel good, or I think that was not appropriate, or simply... I feel as though you're discriminating against me and not going to be reprimanded makes a huge difference whether or not somebody's willing to say something. Now, here's where you all get an opportunity to make a change. If you hear something or see something, don't not say anything. Make sure that you take this as an opportunity to lead, ask questions, make clarifications, or celebrate that person who clearly feels that they are on the receiving side of not feeling good. You can be not only a hero, but an ally, ally and champion the situation. Now, there are all different ways of showing inappropriateness, and there's always a way in which someone can feel different. Let's take, for example, the Crown Act. The Crown Act was a legislative passing that allowed people to wear their hair naturally without being discriminated against. I'm from Jamaica, for example. Dreadlocks was in part of the community and many people know it for reggae. Reggae is a perfect example of music that went international, that brought people together. But let's be clear, many years ago, if a Rastafarian or somebody with braids or dreadlocks came into a community, let's say the community of planning, urban planners, at a conference, you would be noticing that person. In years past, people literally did not feel they had a right to be in a place where they were different because they felt uncomfortable and they were not being recruited because people weren't used to them being different. Something as simple as dreadlocks, a legislative change that made it illegal for someone to discriminate against somebody's hair, opened the door for people to belong. Now let's talk about belonging. Belonging doesn't happen only by training. It happens by being active, activating change. Now, many of the things that I saw when it came to looking at your survey was saying that there is no question that the industry has been trying very hard to be inclusive in how communities are designed. But if organizations are not reflective of those communities, it makes it difficult to build trust in those communities. So when we turn internally and look inside the organizations that you represent, look to see who's leading. Look to see what the succession plan, who are you bringing up through the ranks? What other organizations such as affinity groups that exist for different communities can you go into and bring in people, create leaders or take leaders, collaborate with leaders from other organizations that are not traditionally in urban planning? 
Or let's take, for example, the close related organizations, such as real estate, such as architecture. These are organizations that have infinity groups specifically for it. My example is the National Association of Minority Architects. The National Association of Minority Architects became my safe place during college for me to not only have conversations, but learn about history of urban planning in a way that I'd never seen before. And it was through that leadership that I went to find role models and mentors who made me feel comfortable to challenge not only a system, but just a course curriculum to celebrate the research, the development, and the impact of African-American and a Black architect, specifically who designed Washington, D.C. That didn't show up in my classroom. The conversation, the dialogue didn't exist there. In fact, there were no references whatsoever. But because I knew I had the allyship and the support of that organization, it made a difference. So what does that mean to you? Going to these organizations, not just showing up, but showing up, engaging time after time, not just for the conferences, but for the meetings, for the events, or simply just inviting people to your organization to find out what issues are you working on? What opportunities does exist? What partnerships are there? What mentorship opportunities are there? And how can we do things differently? And what should we keep the same? Now there's a South African quality that I talk about is you are who you are, but you are because of what someone else is. We are all one. Energetically, we are all one. There is where the difference is not who we are, but how we are. Now, what's your story? How do you influence other people? Who have been your influences? Write on a sheet of paper who your influences are and what your story is. How can you use your story to help someone else feel like they belong? I just shared with you a story that changed the trajectory of my life. My professor who told me that there's going to be a challenge with me as a black woman being in the industry because there are very few people who were doing what I was doing and I was studying architecture. Little did he know that my father was an architect, a black man who was an architect. That was my influence. That was my story that kept me going, that inspired me, that made me know that it was possible. But I was lucky, I was born into the industry. Not everybody has that opportunity. Start sharing your story with others and you'll start to recognize how similar that is. Let me use the example. When I'm training with organizations, I often ask people to raise their hand if anybody in the room was adopted. Almost always we find out somebody in the room is adopted. When that person starts to share their story, immediately we have something in common. It's about feeling like you're out of place, but know that you belong, being grateful that you're there, but thinking perhaps something's not right or I'm not relatable. Using stories like that are amazing. Every single time that happens, somebody says, oh, I didn't know you're adopted. Does it matter if someone's adopted or not? No, but it starts to change the narrative of how they show up in the workplace and how they lead because of their story, their influences. Just so start sharing your stories with others and you'll see that's an easy connection. Now I mentioned, I believe in a glass half full approach. The reason being is that if we focus on the history, we'll start to recognize that it doesn't feel very good, that you don't get excited about change because there's so much work to undo. Let's focus on what you can do. Now, feeling relevant is a core value. If you don't feel relevant, you don't want to contribute. How can you personally make somebody feel relevant? Let me give you an example asking the question, what can you contribute? What are your ideas? What do you see wrong? And what opportunities can grow from this? In fact, if you were to do something differently, what would you do differently? When that person gets to talk, share, and express how they feel about a situation, a circumstance, a rule, legislation, or even a plan, you will be surprised how differently they show up for you and how they start to not only take advantage of these opportunities, but they want to grow further. So you must nurture these conversations. Now I created a toolkit really based around change. The toolkit is very simple. It's not just practice what you preach, but what are you learning? How are you using it? How do you adjust the toolkits to make sure that it's relevant for you? Starting with 
where you are and people not making assumptions of what needs to happen. It's customized for each opportunity and each situation. Because just because you look at a roster, you may make some assumptions about what needs to change when in fact, it's not about the roster at all. It's about the revelations of what's happening within the organization. Now let's talk about 1964 versus 2022. The Civil Rights, the Civil Rights Act had a huge influence on what happened from 1964 to 1968. And in 1968 became the Fair Housing Act. Now, when the Fair Housing Act came into play, that completely changed urban planning for everyone because there were protected classes. This meant that it was illegal to discriminate against somebody because of these protected classes. Let me give you an example, race, religion. Now, one could argue that this is not something that shows up in your everyday practice, but in fact it does. Because if someone is feeling discriminated against, now they have an opportunity to protect themselves by what has been passed by law. Now, how often does that come up in your day-to-day -day conversation? Perhaps not often, but I can tell you every time I show up to a meeting, I know that I am protected simply by this law. So if something were to happen, I have a sense of security and confidence that not only will I have an opportunity to continue to move forward, but I can not only protect myself, but those that are around me. In Colorado, we have changes in our laws that allow us to look at other protected classes. I won't go into the details, but what I will tell you that most of the time, people do not pursue having a civil rights violation looked at. Now, this is a compliance issue, but the reason why people don't go forward with making a claim is because it is exhausting for the person who is burdened by the civil rights violation. Because of all that it happens with getting the information, by getting all the people to testify and have witnesses, they don't want to. But I can tell you, change doesn't happen until somebody stands up for the other. You can make a claim or a complaint based on what you observed and remove the burden of the individual that might be receiving of it. Now, this is not an easy process, but it's not impo impossible. Neither was the change from COVID. The changes that we made were not easy, but look where we are now. We made it possible. So I encourage you when you see something that doesn't look like, when you see a bill being passed, when you see a zoning change or boundaries in a neighborhood that are being drawn removed or voted against, start thinking about those that have been impacted by it. And perhaps there is even a civil rights infraction based on the circumstances that are in that community. Now let's talk about age discrimination. Why is this important? When I looked at the results of your survey, it came up time and time again that people who were younger felt that they were uncomfortable with talking to leaders that were older. Now let's flip the switch. We have leaders that are coming in at a much younger age that are working with people that are older and how people interact with one another does matter because their perspective on the world matters. Their perspective on a neighborhood solution matters. Their perspective on how the future of the organization matters. And these conversations have to be had between the different generations to be able to come up with different solutions. Now, let's be crystal clear. Many of the changes that are happening in the generations now are influenced by social media. Conversely, what we are going through as we approach a recession is very similar to those who experience their parents, their grandparents who went through the Great Depression. So what can we learn from these mistakes? What can we learn from the changes that happened that catapulted not only organizations, but individuals? So share something about your background with the people in your organization, with your leadership team, and better yet, if you are a leader, share your experiences of how you got to where you are as a leader. What is your heritage? What is your background? How can people connect with you? I can guarantee you, you will find a story in the way that you were raised or the background that you have, the experiences that you had through school out of school and as a professional that someone can relate to that will open up the door to who you are and how you make your decisions. You will be surprised what that does for changing the work environment. That is simply 
something about who you are and your characteristic that when other people are aware of it, they reciprocate by telling you the same about them. It's about connection. Aretha Franklin said it best. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means to me. You start to gain respect when you allow yourself to be vulnerable and share your differences. Now, share something about yourself that you may not see as obvious, something that you can't see and make those assumptions. I use the example of being adopted. Let's use the example of me. Now I'm here talking to you. You may assume that I'm an African-American woman. Well, I'm not. I actually am from Jamaica. I'm Jamaican born. I came from Jamaica. I am a black woman for some, Caribbean for others, but you may assume I'm African-American, but I am raising children who are here in the United States that are considered African-American. So am I offended if somebody calls me black, African-American? No, but I use the opportunity to talk about where I'm from and what makes me different. But you can make some assumptions about people by looking at them and therefore knowing something about somebody requires you to ask questions. So share with people in your organization or circle something about you that's not obvious by the way that you look. Maybe it's your religion. Maybe it's a disability or it is ability that you have that no one knew about. Now, inclusion opportunities happen, like I mentioned before, when you are intentional, whether it's sharing with your colleagues, whether it's going to conferences, whether it's going to continue education, books, movies, all of those things. But you can't just do it once. Just like any other habit that you have, you have to do it consistently. Consistency is the important thing to do in order to start to see yourself change, not just the environment around you. And as you change and other people change around you, it happens because of your influences. Share the books that you're reading, the classes that you've taken, the aha moments and the uh-oh moments, the pluses, the minuses, the benefits, the opportunities, and the challenges. All of these sharings happen not only from your own experiences, but by learning from others, whether it's reading articles, whether it's going to breakouts in conferences that you normally wouldn't go to, or whether it's simply by just setting the intention alone of being in a room where you are the only. Let me tell you, you will grow. You will start to feel a certain kind of way that you haven't felt before. Lean into that. Lean into that feeling and start to do it until you become comfortable in your own skin and uncomfortable in your own skin so that you know what it's like for others. If you consistently do this before long, you will normalize the experience of being one, a few, or the only. The more you do this, the more it makes it easier when you're in an environment where someone is the only and they are trying to become a part of your group, you can relate to what they're perhaps thinking or saying. Now, your past work experiences matter. I started my life as a work, it worked in my work life in urban planning, the Denver Urban Renewal Authority. I had the privilege and benefit of being involved in a neighborhood that was going through changes. It used to be an airport called Stapleton, and it was being developed into a neighborhood. Those past work experiences of being a part of the planning stages of an urban planned community made a huge difference as to how I show up today. Why? Is because now I live in that neighborhood. 30 years later, what I learned about that neighborhood, always in the back of the mind that I would want to live somewhere like that. Now, initially I was nervous because of the environmental changes, but my work experiences influenced not only how I think, but where I live. And when a situation went down in my neighborhood that made me feel uncomfortable, I could lean back into my past work experiences. My leadership and development training happened outside of the industry. I made the efforts to do that so that I would have more credibility to be seen as someone that someone would take not only seriously, but would advance my career. That required money for me to do so that I invested in myself. Imagine if your organization invested in someone who would not normally have the resources, the confidence, or even the situation to be in a place where they can become a leader, it requires investing in inclusion. That means finding the money, finding the time through mentorship, and finding ways in which that person not only shows up once, twice, but many more times. So what makes you interesting? Sharing those things makes a difference. 
my husband is six foot seven. For many, many years, people would ask him, did you play basketball? That seemed okay on the basketball court. But when he was in a work environment that happened to be real estate, he oftentimes was offended by it until we changed the perspective. And I said to him, but you did play basketball. And sure enough, when we started to change his own perception of using that as a way to connect with people, he was able to move the needle and engage in relationships where he was defensive before and people didn't know what to say or how to say it. It turned out that was just their transition way of saying, I want to get to know you. So what makes you interesting? How can you use it as a positive? Now, diversity is now accepted as a key driver. But when I looked at the statistics and I am tell you most of what people were saying that women felt that their pay was not equal, that women often find, felt that it was hard to find an ally that wanted to promote their interests, their efforts, and Black, Indigenous, people of color in this industry continue to feel like they were not being accepted as a leader, as a contributor. So knowing that this is not only a core value in corporate America, but in urban planning, which is exactly where it needs to be. Now, moving up the ladder, in corporate America is very different than when you're a civil servant. It's not what you are getting from those that you're working with, but what are you giving and serving? There's not a corporate ladder to move up per se in urban planning, but as we know, influence goes up. So mentoring someone makes a difference. I mentioned before, I had been mentored and I selected my mentors. I was purposeful about finding them because it takes time, energy, and money. The Experience that I shared with earlier on about being at the Historical Preservation Awards required not only an invitation, but an investment, an investment time after time, where not only was I being invested in, in the conversations that were being had in the room, but now I was engaging in conversations that didn't exist. Imagine if I wasn't there, who would be talking about the neighborhood that mattered? Case in point, there was a celebratory opportunity for the influence of the African-American community, Five Points. Now, I made it a point to give a standing ovation because I knew of the tireless work that had been happening in the community. Imagine if I wasn't in the room and other people were not celebrating this. Now, guess what happened? The momentum started to build. Other people started clapping, and before you know it, it was a standing ovation for a community that for many years had not been celebrated. I started a momentum, but I didn't finish it. The room was excited and energized, and that momentum will continue next year when somebody outside of the community is being celebrated. Whether I am there or not, people will remember that experience. Now, what a difference a year has made. Let's lean into the new tools that we have, such as social media. Now, let's be crystal clear. Social media can go very wrong. We know how quickly someone can pull out their phone and record something that is going the wrong direction. But it also is an opportunity for growth. Much of what has changed over the last few years in our industry has happened because people have become a witness and has had evidence of things that have gone terribly wrong. What we've seen as a result of gentrification, redlining, discriminatory housing, unfair housing, and affordable housing oftentimes are caught on social media by somebody recording what they've always known has been there and now the world is seeing. Let's also use it as an opportunity to promote great ideas, to promote the good things that are happening in the community, the positive that things are happening. Let's take, for example, a ribbon cutting ceremony in a building that has just been open for, let's use the case of affordable housing. There are many people that don't even know that these programs exist. Imagine if that information was sent out to the world for people to know what's happening in Denver, that not only are we making a change, but we are making a difference. Use it, lean into it, use it as a way to become a more welcoming industry. People will say, I want to be a part of that, whether they're living in the housing or perhaps that might be their career choice. So use it as a platform, a platform that allows you to launch a rocket. I shared with you before that my lock rocket was launched when I did a TEDx idea of bringing philanthropy and real estate together. 
I thought it was unique. I called it philanthropy. Now I wanted to start a movement and I would say that we're starting it. But what I want to share with you is that platform changed who I was because it allowed me to get the word out there, but it started to talk about philanthropy and how philanthropy for me and for what I'd seen in the industry of architecture, real estate, real estate development, and urban planning allowed people to engage in an authentic way, a way that didn't seem like it was just checking a box. Philanthropy was one of those things that made a huge difference, and that happened by me recognizing that who are the communities that we are serving? How am I serving my community? Am I in the majority, the minority, or where are the executives, the leaders? What are they doing to serve in the community? I recognize that it was through philanthropy that allowed people to do that, literally investing in inclusion. When I looked back at the Rockefellers and I looked back at the Kennedys and I looked back at all these big families that made a difference in how our communities were served and how they were formed, it was because of an endowment, an endowment that allowed them to continue to invest in those community. And where does that happen? In communities that people are investing in the infrastructure that are put together, designed, and people are voting on how that community moves forward what the direction is, what the investments are, and yes, even politics. So the demographics of your leadership matters. We can talk about how we want to see things change, but when we actually see the change and the leaders are reflecting the globe and you are starting to have people come into your organization who see themselves, see a reflection of their heritage and their background, you will start to see people gravitating. You will be attracting people into the industry that perhaps thought that was not an option for them or even an opportunity. Let's start where people are thinking about what they're going to do when they grow up. Yes, I'm talking about children. Imagine how kids play house, how kids play superhero all of those things happen right here in our industry, in urban planning. We are the superheroes of every community. We are making a difference in how people engage in buildings, engage in communities, and just like in a planning project, starting with a blighted situation to a redeveloped opportunity and through a thriving community. The same is true when it comes to our industry, figuring out what is not working, what needs to be vacated, what needs to be improved, creating that foundation, re redeveloping it into its highest and best use. There is zero question in my mind that diversity, equity, and inclusion is the highest and best use of bringing people together demographically. So different situations allow you to come up with ways that you can not only lean in, but know when to lean back and let others lead. Finding out what support systems exist, finding out what continuing education opportunities are, not once, but twice. Just like when you see a movie, you go see a movie and you think that's a great movie. You tell a friend about it and they go see the movie. You see that movie a second time and you see scenes that you didn't recognize the first time. You hear words that you didn't hear the first time. By continuously being involved and seeing that movie over and over again, you start to see things differently. Continuing education is not a one-time shot. You don't learn what implicit bias is or a term and learning someone's pronouns or how you can work with somebody of a different gender just once. It be, happens to be a habit. You do it over and over again, taking courses repeatedly, different versions of it, or even the same version to not only see how you are learning, but how the learning is teaching you. When the student becomes a teacher, and you know the rest of that, but literally every time you are in an environment that you're learning about diversity, equity, inclusion, you are at a different stage in your life when you're doing that training. And just like magic, you're seeing something, you're hearing something that now relates to an experience that you've just had because you took the chance and the opportunity to learn something differently. So create those opportunities, watch, learn from different perspectives and figure out how do you create representation, not only of yourself, but those that you can bring into the industry. Get involved. I cannot tell you enough that it's through getting involved that you become not only comfortable, but you start to ask questions that you didn't know you didn't know. You start to hear solutions, solutions that you hadn't thought about. Real estate professionals for years have been a traditional demographic, but as people got involved in civil rights 
discriminatory practices, legislation, laws, working in buildings and bringing buildings together, whether it's mixed use development or whatever it is that has happened in our industry, it was through the involvement of those who insisted on change. If you don't get involved, you can't change. So as you focus on changing and you focus on what makes you different, what makes our industry different, it requires going back to the beginning. What was your experience when you were a student? What made you decide to get in an industry? How did you end up where you are now? How can you create that same opportunity for somebody else? Not once, not twice, but making it part of your daily living, your lived experience, where you are part of that change. I'm thrilled to be able to share the diversity difference experience, and I'm looking forward to us not only growing together, but finding ways in which you can lean in, lean out, and not only get different in how you see things, but make a difference. You're on mute, Sheila. <laughs> Of course I am. That always happens. Um, I did want to thank you for that. And I was saying I have to laugh at the basketball analogy because my son's friend is six, seven, and he is constantly asked, do you play basketball? And he's like, no, I don't. Yes. He, he didn't. He's not <laughs> no. coordinated. It just didn't happen. But he was like, just because I'm tall, people automatically assume that I play basketball and I never have. And it's like, well, just like you said, just lean into it, make a conversation about it, about yourself. And and there is, let, let's just be honest about this there is an implicit bias that if you see in this case if it's a tall person that they play basketball and yes that is a bias and is a stereotype and sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not but like you said it is a wrong assumption for someone to make that if there's a woman in the room that she is the leader or not the leader if there's a man in the room if somebody who is non-binary somebody who doesn't identify as something somebody would assume what their role is in that organization so by simply asking questions that are connecting questions you can get past that awkward feeling right um i don't have any questions if you have any please put them in the chat but um i did have um one question so earlier you talked about um, there was a speaker, she was an African American woman, and I had said you're very well spoken and I didn't mean that as an offensive, but I, you know, you had mentioned that, and it was in an email and she sent me back an article about how that could be offensive, and I didn't really know how to respond, so what would be your take on the best way to approach that is, I didn't mean it that way, how do, you, how do we handle that, or how would I should have handled that? And the reason I bring it up is because this is probably the most common, what I would call an implicit bias, but the implicit bias to your point was not on your end. It is on the receiving of the person who has experienced it so many times because of a negative experience that they had. So they're feeling comfortable enough to say something to you and how you respond back and letting them say, I understand why that might have bothered you share with me a little bit more about your experiences in the past or better yet i don't quite understand share with me your experiences in the past so that i have a, can have a better understanding of it just like people say they're colorblind some use that as a compliment others are really offended by it people have said now and i say people because it's become part of the training that you can't say you're colorblind because everybody has a color now whether that's true or not it is a fact, but some people are taking offense by it because they don't want to be seen as a color. They want to be seen as a person. So while others have used it, and again, let's keep in mind, there was a time where people were considered colored, then they were colored people, and now they're people of color. So it's an innocent mistake, but it has a negative connotation because it charges people, it triggers people to a time where that it was offensive. So when we're talking about things that used to be the way they were, for example, equity, diversity, inclusion used to be diversity, equity, inclusion. The reason equity is now put in front is because if you don't have equity, you can't have inclusion. So things start to change, but people are offended who have been hurt by a situation before. And that is your opportunity to say, let's talk about this a little bit more. And then you start to make a connection. You'll end up finding much more than you ever thought you would find out by simply asking a question. Tell me more. Tell me more. Okay, so I have another question. I don't see any other, so I'm just going to take this over. Let's, um, let's do it. When 
People, I often have people say to me, I'm not prejudiced. And to me, I believe that's a universal lie. I think everyone <laughs> has some type of prejudice and it's based on your experiences throughout your life. What are, what are your thoughts on that? So you're right. Everybody has prejudice. Everybody has biases and it's all influenced by the way you were raised and the people that were around you. Same is true as we get older, we have different prejudices. Let's use um, age discrimination, for example. People often are prejudiced about somebody who is very young and they may be in denial about it, but same is true. The person who's younger has a prejudice against somebody who's older. Let me use an example of Generation X. I had a friend who said to me, well, what it took you 50 years to learn, I can go on Google and learn in 50 seconds. The prejudice was, is that I know more than you as a generation X person speaking, because I can find more information, more resources. I can find a video. I can find evidence in 50 seconds. And you're telling me that your 50 years matters more than mine. Both is right and wrong, but that prejudice does exist. How you respond to that prejudice makes a huge difference because it no longer becomes an issue if you have more than one characteristic to determine or to define the situation. So knowing that we all have those prejudices, you lean into other things that matter, then that starts to disappear. It becomes less as the primary issue or concern, and it becomes a part of who we are. Just like admitting that you are, you have a weakness. A prejudice can be a strength, but it could also be weakness. But as we all know, and I'll lean into my, our Brene Brown, being vulnerable, allows those prejudices to be neutral. Now, when they are exercised from all the other biases that exist, when you add prejudice and bias and you're unwilling to change, that's when it becomes an issue. But when you can acknowledge your prejudice, I liked tall men. That was my prejudice. But then I learned that there was so much more that mattered for me in terms of that lived experience another prejudice. I'm from Jamaica. My husband's from the United States of Mississippi. There are some many different prejudices about those communities and how they see discrimination, how they see the workforce and what opportunities are. The prejudice was that because he played basketball, that that was going to be his long-term goal. It was his ticket to get out of the community. But the prejudice was that you can only play basketball, which is why he was offended by the person saying, did you play basketball? Because people assume that's the only thing he could do. He also had this image that the only way you could make money was playing professional basketball until he found out later on that there were so many other industries and opportunities that existed. But that ticket out of the community allowed him to see those other things. So when you find out what more exists around what your prejudices are, then you start to learn and grow from that experience. All right. Well, I don't have any more questions. Do you have any closing thoughts you want to share before we log off and let everybody get back to their day? What I will say is that, as you know, that there was the survey that was done and some people at the conference mentioned that they didn't have a chance to see the survey. And that's exactly what needs to happen. The seed has been planted using the survey to lean in to learn it. Literally throughout the survey, it was almost 40 to 50% between all the answers that were there. That means we have more opportunity to grow. But looking at the survey results and digging into it and asking questions of different organizations to see how does that resonate with them and what does that mean for their organization matters and measuring it. The example I used at conferences next year, everybody brings somebody who's unlike them. We had the survey came up with somebody who was non-binary and I had the opportunity after the meeting to talk to that individual. And she said, that was me. And I couldn't believe that it was brought up because I knew that I was taking a risk and putting it out there, but I wanted people to know that I existed and no one's ever asked the question because of that survey made her want to be there and be in a situation where she was assumed as being her for so many years. And she got to show up in a non-binary way that didn't feel bad, ugly, or the only in urban planning. Now we could be safe to assume there are plenty of people who are non-binary in urban planning. Imagine how she is going to share that story with so many people. Surveys do matter. Results of those surveys matter, but leaning into it, growing with it, 
and having the invitation for people to have in a conversation. Now we did go further on to have a conversation and that individual didn't feel comfortable saying why she got into the industry, but she did go on to say that it was important to her that the industry was accepting of her feelings, but also her expertise and how her expertise would make a difference in the communities that she works in and the communities that as an individual will now show up in ways that couldn't before. So it's important to recognize differences, ask more questions, and invite people to share not only their opinion, but their expertise around their lived experience being in this industry. So next year, bring someone who's unlike you intentionally, even if it's an uncomfortable conversation, so that we can change not only who's in the room, but what happens in the room. That's great. And I do have all the results from that survey. We're going to be posting them online. We're going to be putting them out in our newsletter, links to them. So anyone who wants to see all of that. And our we do have an equity, diversity, and inclusion committee. So if anyone's interested in joining that, be sure to send me an email and I can get you connected. And they are looking to do some plans throughout the year to talk more about the survey and what we can do as planners within our own field to attack this issue. So I want to thank you again, Lori. It's been a great two sessions that I've sat through with you. I loved it. And um, everyone else, go about and have a great day. I'll put this recording up probably within 24 hours. Fantastic. So, thank you. Bye. Thank you again. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.